Thank you for listening to Depictions Media Radio. Welcome to Policy and Rights, the show about government policy and human rights. Bonjour. Welcome, everyone. Uh, bienvenue à tout le monde. I'm Alex Mayu. I'm with Minister Holland. Uh, je m'appelle Alexandra Mayu. Je suis avec le ministre Holland. Uh, merci pour être ici aujourd'hui. On va commencer l'événement. We'll start the event now. Uh, today, you'll be hearing from Minister Holland, the Federal Minister of Health, the Honorable Yara Sachs, Federal Minister of Mental Health and Addictions, and Associate Minister of Health, and the Honorable Mark McLean, who is the Minister of Health and Wellness for PEI. Also joined by the uh, provincial and territorial ministers of health from across Canada. Following the remarks by Minister Holland, Minister Sachs, and Minister McLean, we'll open the floor to media for a question and answer. All ministers who are here today and also those who are available online will be here to answer your questions. Uh, we'll begin with questions in the room and then move to online for reporters who are online. Uh, après les remarques, nous donnerons la parole aux médias pour une période de questions et réponses. On va commencer avec les questions dans la salle et ensuite euh, les questions en ligne. In the interest of time, we ask that you uh, keep your questions to the topic of today, of the very important meeting. Uh, même chose en français, uh, afin de garder, de gagner du temps, on vous demande de garder vos questions au sujet du jour. Et on va commencer maintenant avec notre premier orateur. We'll begin now with our first speaker. Uh, la parole est à vous. Over to you, Minister Holland. Mer Merci beaucoup, Alex. C'est un grand plaisir d'être ici avec euh, mon homologue euh, de chaque province et territoire. Euh, euh, malheureusement, c'était nécessaire pour euh, quelques personnes de participer virtuellement, mais euh, c'était une, une, vraiment une bonne discussion aujourd'hui. And I want to start uh, by saying and acknowledging that we are gathered on the traditional and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. Uh, and I also want to start uh, by thanking Minister uh, McLean uh, for uh, hosting us in uh, beautiful British Columbia, where we've had uh, two days of, of really rich and meaningful conversations. Excuse me, PEI. There you go. I was in British Columbia. Yeah, yes. What was it yesterday? Yes. Yeah, so I was in British Columbia yesterday announcing the, the bilateral agreement, which was very exciting. But no, I'm. this is also an extremely beautiful province on the other side of the coast here in PEI, uh, where we've had a wonderful discussion. And uh, I just want to say, Mark, you've done a phenomenal job hosting us here uh, over the last couple of days. You know, all of us here on this stage are charged with an incredible responsibility, uh, and that is the health of Canadians. And Canadians look to us to make sure that uh, in their moment uh, of greatest vulnerability, uh, that the system that they've uh, been so proud of is going to be there for them. And it's not just about making sure that that system is there for them uh, when they're ill, but that system prevents them from getting ill, that stops them from ever getting sick in the first place. And we had an opportunity with the Canadian Medical Association, with the, uh, the Canadian Federation of, uh, of Nurses, and with uh, health care prof uh, professionals to hear from them about the state of our health care system. Uh, and the, the reality is we have so much to be proud of in our health care system, so many remarkable things happening, so many incredible ways that it is there for Canadians. But it's also really stretched. Uh, and this is a time, particularly in workforce, uh, where we're facing crisis. Uh, and where we have to rise to that occasion. Uh, COVID tested us uh, hard. Uh, our system was already under stress uh, and dealing with a global pandemic um, uh, that strained and asked so much of, of so few. Uh, and the weight that they had to carry, our doctors, our nurses, our personal, uh, our personal support workers, all of the folks in the health system, all that they had to carry 
uh, it was really more than any, that it could be asked of any human. Uh, and yet they did it. And of course they came out and our system is exhausted and stretched and in need of support. And that's what we're here to, uh, to work on and make sure that we deliver. Uh, nothing short of the transformation of our health system uh, can be our overall objective. And uh, I think there's enormous room for optimism. And I'll start with the people that I'm assembled uh, here today. Uh, health ministers uh, representing uh, every province and every territory of different political stripes unified uh, in the idea that we need total collaboration, that we need to work together for solutions, that the spirit that we found in the pandemic, which was rising to the challenge of the pandemic and making sure that the country, and, uh, and this includes our relationships with provinces and territories, have one of the best pandemic responses anywhere in the world, the way that we work together, the way that we collaborate, uh, I think is instructive to the path forward on health, to make sure that uh, we have already one of the best health systems in the world, but that we move to having the best health system in the world something that is there now and in the future for folks to be able to count on. Uh, C'est la première fois que nous participons à la réunion des ministres de santé du Canada et nous sommes reconnaissants d'avoir l'occasion de discuter de nos priorités communes et de le voile collectif et, sur, euh, et suivre et ce que les Canadiens et les Canadiens nous ont dit au sujet du système, système de santé. And I want to take a few moments to talk about some of the concrete outcomes that came from our extremely pro productive conversations of the last two days. And I'm going to start in the area of health workforce, uh, where the needs are most critical. Uh, so our plan for a strong and sustainable health workforce is one that is shared by all levels of government and dominated our conversations over the last two days. Le soutien uh, de travailleurs en santé et l'embouche euh, aideront à faire en sorte que les Canadiens et les Canadiens en attendent de soins nécessaires l'obtiennent au moment et l'endroit où ils ont besoin. And during our meeting, uh, we reconfirmed our commitment to supporting health workforce and working together on concrete actions in five particularly, uh, in five tangible areas. I'll start with retention because retention is, I think, the most important key. Uh, we have to hold the core of who we have, the incredible people who have been lifting us up in these difficult times. We need to contribute to collaborate with them to make sure that retention issues are put at the fore. And so I'm going to start with this talking about the, uh, the dissemination and implementation of the, uh, of the nursing retention toolkit. Nous continuerons à travailler de façon collaborative sur le matin en poste uh, de uh, travailleurs en santé en mettant l'accent sur, euh, sur le matin en poste de personnel infirmier cette année et des autres professions de la santé dans les années à venir. Nous commencerons par la diffusion et la mise en ouverture d'une trousse à outils pour le maintien en poste de personnel infirmier. Secondly, I'm going to talk about the domestic uh, education supply. Together, uh, we're undertaking a study of education and training supply demands for key healthcare professionals to identify the best pan-Canadian approaches to meet future healthcare demands for Canadians over the next decade. Three, foreign credential rec recognition and ethical recruitment. We have committed to reducing the time it takes for internationally educated health professionals to join our workforce by allowing them to begin the credential process overseas by expediting pathways for those who have successfully completed training and education that is equivalent uh, to a graduate from an approved Canadian program, and by reducing the time for licensure for qualified nurses and physicians. This includes a commitment from health ministers to a 90-day service standard for regulatory bodies to provide certification and licensure to internationally educated health professionals. Next, talk about labor mobility and the importance for uh, those in the workforce to be able to work throughout this country. Uh, we will together implement a process that allows health professionals in good standing in one jurisdiction to practice in any other Canadian jurisdiction without significant delay or the need to meet additional regulatory requirements. We'll focus on physicians this year and nursing in future years. Nous, uh, nous mettrons une ouvre, un processus qui permettra aux professionnels de la santé en, 
en réglé dans une province ou un territoire d'exercer de de leur profession dans une autre province ou un autre territoire sans retard. Important, ni besoin de, de satisfaire des autres exigences réglementaires. Nous nous concentrons sur les médecins cette année et sur le infirmi personnel infirmière dans les années à venir. Lastly, on workforce data and planning. We commit to working together to improve the availability of sharing and standardization of health workforce data, improving planning, as well as supporting the establishment of the Center of Excellence for the Future of Health Workforce. This is critically important to make sure that we don't just deal with the health workforce issues we're facing today, but to make sure that we know exactly who we need in the future and that we've got the plan to have the health force uh, that we need to meet the challenges of the future. With respect to digital health and health data, data isn't always sexy to talk about, but data saves lives. And we've been talking a lot for a long time over data and, and there was a really rich conversation today. One of the reasons our healthcare system is under strain is because we're not fully harnessing the power of health information to improve outcomes, to support healthcare workers and create efficiencies. In a society where just about everything you can imagine is accessible electronically, most patients don't have access to their own electronic health information. This information is not always shared between health professionals to support their care. This often results in duplication of tests, increased costs, safety risks, as well as frustrations alike for doctors and patients. As I mentioned, we've been talking about this a long time. Well, as part of the Working Together uh, plan, Governments are committed to modernizing the healthcare system through improvement to health data and digital tools. Dans le plan de travailler ensemble, le gouvernement se sent engagé à moderniser le système de santé en améliorant les données de santé et les outils numériques. Specifically, we are committed to adopt common standards and policies and to improve the way health information is collected, shared, used, and reported to Canadians. This means that Canadians will be able to see what improvements are being made to their healthcare system. Today, we discussed how, together, we will make progress on these commitments by endorsing a pan-Canadian health data charter and a joint federal territorial action plan on health data and digital health. This charter emphasizes the importance of putting people at the center of our healthcare system and ensuring they have access to their own health information building and maintaining trust on how data is used and shared to make sure that privacy is protected while promoting fairness, equity, and respecting indigenous control over their data. The Charter is one element of a broader plan to advance health data commitments. The action plan builds on progress underway to adopt common standards so data can securely flow between health and data systems throughout the implementation of a pan-Canadian interoperability roadmap. And that ability for systems to be able to communicate is so critical. Le chart fait partie d'un plan plus vaste visant à faire progresser les engagements en matière de données de santé. Le plan d'action s'appuie sur les progrès réalisés pour adopter les normes communes, afin que les données puissent, puissent circuler d'une façon sécurisée entre les systèmes, les données de santé grâce à la mise en œuvre d'une feuille de route pan-canadienne de l'interopabilité. The action plan also prioritizes other key areas needed to improve health data, such as harmonizing our approaches to responsible use and stewardship of health data, better sharing of public health information, building of public trust, which is so key to combat misinformation that we know was at the heart of so many problems during the pandemic. Understanding how health information is used for public good with appropriately, uh, appropriate privacy safeguards. My colleague, Minister Stacks, will be talking in a moment about the important work that we uh, have been talking about over the last few days as well on mental health and substance use. Finally, with respect to public health, we all know that COVID-19 had a significant impact on health, social and economic well-being of people right across the country. Today, we reflect on that collaboration as I spoke at the beginning and how our jurisdictions respond to the pandemic and continue to continue to apply those lessons addressed uh, for the best interests of public health. Understanding that public health is as essential as any other part of our health system to the health and well-being of our nation. 
Folks, I am deeply encouraged by the spirit of the conversations that we've had. There is no doubt the ministers at the table today had one thing in their heart and one thing on their minds, which is the betterment of health of Canadians and the betterment of the health system that serves them. It was a great honour to participate with all of my colleagues today. And I want to thank uh, Mark, specifically you once again, for hosting us here in PEI uh, for, this, uh, for this amazing uh, last two days. Thanks, folks, and it's a pleasure now, now to turn it over to my colleague and friend, Yara Sachs. Thank you, Mark, and thank you for everyone who is here in PEI. Um, it's a pleasure to be joining you here today. Um, as Minister Holland mentioned, this is our first health minister's meeting, and it was an important opportunity to discuss how we can continue to work together as we strengthen the health and care for care of Canadians. And I can't emphasize enough the energy and commitment around the tables and the discussions to a collaborative and strong approach to ensuring that the health and well-being of Canadians is at the centre of all of our work together. But before I go any further, I want to acknowledge that our healthcare system would not exist without the skilled and dedicated workers who keep it running. Health workers are truly the heroes of our healthcare system and have been through a lot over the past few years, a lot. Both during COVID, uh, the, during the COVID pandemic and its aftermath, you have been there day in and day out to show up for Canadians each and every single day. And we are tremendously grateful for that. These workers have shown incredible resilience, but there is no doubt that the pressure in working in a system that faces many challenges has taken a toll, both physically and mentally. And that's why it has been both my priority and everyone around the table today who understands that supporting our health workers is and must be central to the plan to improve our healthcare system. We cannot care for Canadians without you and you need to be cared for as well. As Minister Holland mentioned, we are working with the provinces and territories to retain existing workers, as well as to recruit and train new ones. Comme a mentionné le Ministre Holland, nous collaborons avec les provinces et les territoires à la retention des travailleurs existants, ainsi que l'embauche et la formation de nouveaux, de nouveaux travailleurs. We are also working to find ways to help internationally educated health professionals put their skills and experience to work here more quickly and improving processes for existing health workers to work across jurisdictions, including our nurses, is another part of this shared priority. Nous nous employons également à trouver des façons d'aider les professionnels de la santé formés à l'entendre de mettre plus rapidement à profit leurs compétences et leur expérience, l'amélioration des processus pour permettre aux travailleurs de la santé actuelle de travail travailler dans des autres administrations s'inscrit également dans ces priorités partagées. It's with a strong and well-supported health workforce in place, we can ensure that Canadians have access to the health care they need, but also when they need it. That includes mental health care and substance use services. The need for these services is staggering, particularly amongst our young people who were hit hard through the pandemic. And as we all know, there's no health without mental health. That's why earlier this year, our government announced nearly 200 billion over 10 years to provinces and territories to improve the healthcare for Canadians, including a focus on improving access to timely, equitable and quality mental health and substance use services. Today, my colleagues and I have agreed to continue to working together to support the mental health of young people and their families, as well as support individuals with complex needs. We need to care for our most vulnerable in their time of need. We also discussed the implementation and launch of the 988 Suicide Crisis Helpline, which will be available as of November 30th. Once the helpline launches, people in Canada, regardless of where they live, will have access to bilingual, trauma-informed, and culturally appropriate suicide prevention support through phone and text at any time of day, every day of the year. We must continue our collaboration to address the toxic drug supply and overdose crisis. Since my appointment in July, I've had the time to visit several communities affected by substance use. We see you, we hear you, we will be working together. Nous devons poursuivre notre collaboration afin de nous attaquer à l'approvisionnement en drogues toxiques et la crise de surdose. 
Depuis ma nomination en juillet, j'ai eu l'occasion de visiter plusieurs collectifs dont la population était au prix avec des problèmes de consommation de substances. And I've heard heartbreaking stories of addiction and loss, as have many of my colleagues. But I've also heard inspiring stories of support, recovery, and hope. J'ai entendu des histoires de cherchantes de dépendance et de perte, mais on a aussi fait par des histoires inspirantes inspirant de soutien, de rétablissement et d'espoir. My ministerial colleagues and I want to build on that hope. We want to build on that relentless compassion. We all recognize the value of compassionate, evidence-based services that can keep people safe and provide a pathway to recovery. Canadians must have access to a full range of services and tools to address substance use. Every journey on the path that one takes to recovery must may be different, and we know that but we must have a full toolbox of resources for those who struggle with substance use. And that's why our government supports a comprehensive approach focused on prevention, harm reduction, treatment, and enforcement. Because we must use every tool, we must be compassionate, and we must be relentless. That is why we're looking forward to launching the renewed Can Canadian Drugs and Substances Strategy. Our approach will continue to use both a public health and public safety lens and we will be working together to ensure that individuals are supported while supporting also those families and loved ones who need their help as well. At the same time, we continue to challenge the stigma and tear down the barriers that prevent people from getting the help that they need. When walls are up, those who need our help are not seen. But when we break down stigma, when we bring light to those who must be seen, when we, those who we must embrace, and give them the care and the services that they need, we will create resilient communities together. Because when people get the right support, we know that there is hope. And in my short time in this role, I've had the chance to hear so many stories of Canadians who have received support and their lives have been changed for the better because of it. The overdose crisis we are facing is a very complex one and it's easy to look at the statistics and feel overwhelmed. But the truth is, we are not powerless in this fight, and we are not without tools, and we are not without hope. There is a lot that we, as Canadians, and of all our colleagues here who have worked together over the past two days, can do to save the lives and turn the tide of this crisis. I'm very encouraged by our discussions today, and I look forward to our continued collaboration as we work to support the mental health and well-being of Canadians. Thank you. I will now hand it over to Minister McLean. Uh, thank you, Minister Sachs. Um, as you can probably hear, uh, I'm in the process of losing my voice. Um, that speaks to the volume of conversations that we've had over the past two days. Uh, and as chair, I was very proud to host uh, my colleagues in Prince Edward Island. It's, uh, we, we do one thing well in PEI and is, is our hospitality. So it was a privilege and an honor uh, to chair uh, our last two days of meetings, which were, again, extremely robust, extremely helpful. I think we all share a lot of commonalities in our issues um, that we face. Um, not all solutions are tailor-made uh, to each province, but um, it's important that the collaboration and, again, even the off-meeting time was extremely valuable to all of us to have uh, social conversations about our healthcare systems. I also want to thank the uh, Canadian Association of Emergency Physicians, uh, CMA, CFNU, and the PEI Alliance uh, for Mental Wellbeing to present to us. It was very important. E each one of those stakeholders is an important piece of our healthcare system. So they were very valuable conversations. Uh, we look forward to the Empower report that is coming out um, from our emergency uh, room physicians uh, soon. Thank you to Dr. Ross, who visited um, one of our patient medical homes and, and I appreciate her excitement for the collaborative care model that we've, uh, we've begun to implement in PEI. So it was very affirming to hear Dr. Ross and her excitement um, after visiting one of our homes um, that we have stood up on Prince Edward Island. So I, I guess in closing, it's been, it's been an honor to, to uh, chair this committee. I'm very fortunate that my colleague, uh, Minister Thompson from Nova Scotia, will will carry the baton for the next FBT. So it's nice to ha uh, 
host these ministers uh, within Atlanta, Canada, so we can have Atlanta, Canada, and national conversations uh, with regards to health care. So, again, I do also want to recognize our health care workers. Over the past few weeks, I've embarked on a Focus on the Frontline tour. I've had over 100 uh, meetings with health care workers, and that includes RNs, physicians, payroll, uh, OTs, and it's been very beneficial. And my single biggest takeaway from that is the passion that they have for their job um, sitting across from them it, it you can feel that it, it's palpable um, so we appreciate what they've done for us i think we all recognize we are in a reactive phase of of health care we're now in a proactive phase so that does excite me that you know we have a sense of urgency i think at the table that we need to react we need to expedite we need to work on workforce pathways, licensure, and all those issues uh, going forward. So I think if uh, from a theme perspective, I think uh, the ministers behind me understand the importance of, of urgency and our ability to act and to continue to, to support those healthcare workers. So, so thank you and uh, welcome to Prince Edward Island. Thank you to uh, Minister Holland, to Minister Sachs and Minister McLean. Uh, merci à nos co-présidents ainsi qu'à la ministre Sachs. We'll now take some questions in the room. I see there's a lineup already. Um, if you can state your name, your media outlet, and who your question is for, you'll have one question and one follow-up. Uh, en français, veuillez indiquer votre nom, votre média et uh, à qui votre question est posée. Et ensuite, on ira à la ligne. Go ahead. Hello, uh, my name is Teresa Wright. I'm with iPolitics. My question is for Minister Holland. Um, on the bilateral health uh, accords, um, the, the money for, the, the, for these deals was announced in February. Um, it's billions of dollars on the table for these provinces. I know that you did announce an agreement with BC um, this week, but why is it taking so long to reach deals with the other provinces? And how much is politics playing a role in, in, uh, in the progress of those deals? Well, thank you so much for the question. It's, it's taking a long time because so it's got to be done right. Uh, you know, I got into this job uh, just over two months ago uh, and immediately getting into the job, I reached out to the good folks here to talk about uh, the status of the bilateral agreements and make sure that, um, uh, that we get the results uh, that we need uh, working collaboratively. You know, one of the things um, that is, is going to be so critical about this and we're all committed to it, is to make sure Canadians can see uh, as, as to see that progress, see it in data, see it empirically. Uh, and uh, because it's it's essential um, that we have that. Uh, and, uh, you know, what you measure, uh, you achieve. And uh, so that, uh, look, it takes some time to have those conversations, but those conversations have been extremely fruitful. We had an opportunity uh, to, uh, 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 to launch uh, with BC on Tuesday with Minister uh, Dix, uh, who was right over there. Uh, and I think it was a phenomenal day uh, for British Columbia and Canada. And, uh, and that uh, really laid out the next three years um, of, of how we're gonna be collaborating together and what folks can expect. Uh, we're going to have others that are happening very, very soon. So you don't have to wait very long, uh, but the reality is we've got to get this right and uh, respect the partnership we have with provinces. You know, there's, uh, there's really rich conversations that we're having here uh, and around those bilaterals. Teresa, your follow-up? Uh, and just on Pharmacare, um, you, the NDP rejected the last version of the bill that your government presented to them. Um, they've said that they'll accept nothing less than um, universal single, single payer program that is administered through the public system. Will you commit to that as the model in the upcoming bill? Well, you're right. The conversations are continuing with, uh, with the New Democrats and indeed with all parliamentarians about uh, how we make sure that people aren't put into an impossible position where they have to figure out how to pay for an essential item or pay for essential drugs. Uh, and I, I'm very proud of the work that has been done in partnership with provinces. You know, about $3.5 billion is saved every single year as a result of bulk purchasing. Uh, and we're moving forward with a, a national strategy on, uh, on, on rare diseases, uh, drugs for rare diseases that we're working with provinces on. 
Um, and so there's a lot of things that are happening outside of this specific issue. And of course, I understand the attention to this issue. Uh, we've committed to legislation and we've committed to a process. But just as I was, you know, when I was House Leader, uh, getting to agreement with other parties isn't easy. Um, and that's the reality of a minority parliament. But I think Canadians expect us to work together. And they respond, respect us, they expect us, frankly, on the one hand, to, re to make sure that they, they aren't put in that situation I was describing with their drug costs and to make sure that we help uh, help them, but at the same time also make sure we're responsible with the fiscal purse. Um, that we are in a situation where we have to act prudently, uh, uh, that we don't have the ability to, uh, you know, to, uh, to, to, to spend you know, what could be 40 or $45 billion, uh, you know, we have to be uh, prudent. So it's, there's, a, there's an ongoing discussion and, and, uh, and I look forward to its continuance. Next question. Bonjour, Nicolas Stenbach avec Radio-Canada. Cette question en français est pour le ministre Holland. C'est encore sur les transferts en santé euh, des associations comme euh, l'Association médicale canadienne qui demande comment ça se fait, Monsieur Holland, qu'après tous ces mois, les transferts en santé ne sont pas encore disponibles dans les coffres des provinces qui en ont besoin, spécialement ici aussi en Atlantique. Alors, c'est quoi votre explication et quand est-ce que cet argent sera disponible oui, l'argent est disponible. Alors, il y a chaque année, évidemment, il y a un transfert d'argent pour chaque province et ça continue. Mais c'est la question avec les, les nouveaux, une autre discussion avec des autres provinces sur les questions des de, de, de bilateral agreements. Ça, ça, ça continue et je pense qu'on peut trouver une solution bientôt. Uh, mais vraiment, c'est une obligation dans, avec un esprit de coopération uh, de chercher uh, la façon de, de faire deux choses spécifiquement. Uh, premièrement, uh, d'avoir l'indicateur, les données uh, disponibles publiquement uh, pour, les, pour les personnes de voir partout au pays qu'est-ce que c'est l'utilisation d'argent. Parce que ça, c'est tellement important. Et, et pour moi, ce n'est pas une question de, de juridiction, c'est vraiment une question de l'habilité de voir le progrès et de voir que l'argent qui est là euh, est utilisé dans une bonne façon d'améliorer notre système de santé. Et deuxièmement, euh, avec notre, euh, notre, notre euh, euh, bilateral agreement, je m'excuse pour ça, et, et l'occasion d'avoir de, euh, de, de, une conversation Uh, pour les trois prochaines années, uh, qu'est-ce que c'est le but, qu'est-ce que c'est le, 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 le type de coopération est, uh, est possible. Et, et, et plus que ça, les, des, uh, les conversations pour les dix prochaines années, parce qu'il y a spécifiquement dans, dans le bilateral agreement, il y a des, des informations pour trois ans, uh, mais on a on, on on besoin vraiment de uh, d'avoir une conversation pour, pour plus longue que ça. Alors, c'est complexe, mais uh, le, uh, je suis certain que uh, le, les, uh, il va y avoir uh, uh, une agreement, une uh, agreement, une attente bientôt. Merci. Uh, question de suivi avec le ministre de la Santé, Christian Dubé, pour uh, le Québec. Uh, Monsieur Dubé, D'ailleurs, avant ma question de suivi, je, est -ce que, bon, je, je crois comprendre que le Québec n'a toujours pas signé l'entente bilatérale, mais on, on, met, met, mettez cette réponse dans votre réponse autant que possible. Ma question est concernant des organismes de lutte contre le cancer qui demandent euh, au Québec que le cancer soit considéré comme une grande priorité, le ministère de la Santé. Ils demandent aussi des données plus précises concernant la, la prévalence du cancer au Québec. Euh, C'est une demande répétée depuis plusieurs années. Je sais qu'il y a deux questions dans ma question de suivi, mais... Si vous pouviez répondre les deux en même temps. Mais rapidement, euh, c'est sûr que nous, on veut aussi au Québec avoir euh, l'argent le plus rapidement possible, mais on a dit que cet argent-là devait être disponible sans condition. Alors ça, pour nous, c'est clair, pour ne pas changer là-dessus. Euh, deuxièmement, pour ce qui est des données du cancer, comme vous le savez, on est probablement une des premières provinces qui a mis euh, des données dans un tableau de bord pour suivre justement l'amélioration dont on parle le ministre Orland. Puis, on est tout à fait d'accord avec cette approche-là d'avoir des données. Bon, plus spécifiquement sur le cancer, on a mis à jour euh, dans notre tableau de bord cet été, pas plus tard qu'en juillet dernier, plusieurs nouvelles données. Mais euh, c'est on, on partait très loin au Québec en termes de données sur le cancer. Donc, oui, on est tout à fait d'accord avec les demandes qui nous sont faites. Et je vous donnerai juste un exemple. On, on est en train de finaliser, par exemple, des nouveaux processus 
euh, pour vérifier, par exemple, au niveau du cancer de l'utérus. Alors, il y a plusieurs actions qu'on pose. Alors, on est tout à fait d'accord avec euh, la question, est-ce qu'on pourrait avoir plus de données sur le cancer, qui est probablement une des plus grandes causes de décès au Canada. Alors, oui, on est 100 d'accord avec cette demande-là. Merci. Merci. Prochaine question. Next question. <coughs> Kerry Campbell, CBC. I have a question for uh, the host minister. We will get him up. I just you mentioned Minister McLean, the uh, the tour the Canadian Medical Association had. Dr. Kathleen Ross of, of one of our medical homes in PEI, the Collaborative Care Clinics. I think it got a glowing review, and the CMA says this is the model they want to see in all the provinces which haven't adopted this system yet. Uh, today, though, we found out that the clinic in Summerside is having to reassign thousands of patients, uh, 700 of those will go to virtual care because that clinic does not have the doctors it needs. It has one of four positions filled, I think is what it said in that. So what are some tangible things you think are coming out of these meetings which are going to allow you to hire, whether it's those positions or any of the other vacancies in, in your healthcare system? Uh, thank you, Carrie. Obviously, we all understand that physician supply has not kept up with population growth. You know, obviously, uh, this problem has it's been a long time coming. Um, I'm excited by the expedited pathways that we've created, the scope of practice. Um, again, on Prince Edward Island, we have the, we've created the associate physician uh, program. So we're we're hopeful to to integrate those new healthcare providers into our system. We understand that the challenges in healthcare. Um, the, the top three are staffing, staffing, and staffing. So again, it, with regards to that clinic, um, we need to continue to recruit and, and train um, physicians on Prince Edward Island. So again, we've made that long-term investment in, in the me medical school here on Prince Edward Island. So we understand that we do have to create our own. Uh, we know from the research that uh, local and ties to the community are important in that recruitment process. So again, that's a long-term approach to our problem. But I think over the last two days, we've understood that we need to work on the resident matching program with CARMS. We need to look at expedited uh, pathways. We need to look at scope of practice. So um, we are experiencing net gains in our system. I know people don't always experience them, but again, um, you know, our current and some of our older physicians have large practices with, that require you know, one to three doctors to replace them. And again, we continue to see significant population growth on Prince Edward Island, which is challenging. So we do have to swim against the population current from time to time. But uh, again, I think uh, some of these steps and some of the uh, initiatives that we spoke of in the last two days will, will start to yield results. Thank you. And it's just, if you want to stay there, and if anyone else, maybe I don't know if the federal minister wants to join as well, but I think he's kind of addressed this. When we talk about those bilateral funding agreements, it was announced for PEI back, I think it was February 22nd. We had a few provinces announced that day. They had an agreement in principle. And as I recall, what we were told is that money would be able to be used in this year's PEI health budget. So I just wonder from your point of view, what are the sticking points such that you still haven't ratified that agreement? Uh, yeah, we've always been proud of our relationship with the federal government. Our premier has always been very collaborative with our federal partners. So uh, again, I think we're close on the bilats uh, from that perspective. We all understand that money won't fix everything in healthcare. So again, we are, uh, I shouldn't say that with my federal minister behind me with regards to funding. But um, again, I, I'm, I'm confident that our bilats, we've, we've proven in the past to be one of the first at the table with regards to early child care, childhood educators and, and day, $10 a day daycare. So I'm proud of that relationship. So um, the bilat money will flow um, and we will continue to invest. And we have had a, the biggest uh, health care increase in our budget in history. We have about 14%. So we are putting our money uh, behind our health care system. Next question. Hi. <clears throat> Hi. I have a question uh, for uh, Minister McLean. My name is Tin Nguyen. I'm with The Guardian here in Charlottetown. Um, we've been hearing a lot about population growth in PEI, and uh, by 2030, the province is projected to reach uh, 200,000 people here on PEI. That's going to put a lot of strain on the healthcare system here. Is there anything that comes out of the meetings the past two days that you think it's going to help uh, population growth and the strain it's going to have on uh, have the healthcare system here? Yeah, I think it's a challenge for all of us uh, on this stage here um, today as we're all experiencing significant population growth. 
um, in all our jurisdictions. So it is a challenge in providing health care. Again, back to collaborative care, Dr. Ross, um, you know, our practices are, are family doctor centric, centric at this time, and we need to move away from that. I always explain it as we have a inverted pyramid with the family doctor at the at the point where we need to turn that pyramid around where your entry into the system has many many entry points so we've started that process so i think that's an important part of our transformation of our healthcare system um and even again from the federal government uh perspective they've increased the uh, express entry program for healthcare workers they're going to double um who they uh, uh expedited expedited pathways um through immigration so hopefully that will help um satisfy our, you know, help our, our human resource challenges. Thank you. Follow up question? Next question. Hi. Oh, hi. I'm Alana Pickerel with CTV. I have a maritime related question. So that might be Minister McLean again. Um, specifically for the Maritimes, is there a list of priorities that came out this week when it comes to what needs to be done first and foremost? Uh, I guess I will speak on behalf of my um, Minister Fitz and Minister Thompson, uh, who joined us virtually over the past two days. So, again, uh, we always, uh, Minister uh, uh, Osborne as well, is uh, it's important that Atlantic um, ministers continue to collaborate, again, because some services we can't provide in some jurisdictions, so we require cooperation. So, again, those conversations, we're proud of those relationships that we do. But specifically to the last two days, we focused on, on you know, um, not regional uh, needs, but more national and, and, and provincial-based uh, needs. Follow-up? You say that you didn't focus on regional needs. Um, obviously, though, is a top priority for a lot of people who are living in all of these regions that are looking for health care commitments. But just as a whole, I guess, when can Canadians in this case and Maritimers expect to start to see some of these steps really be implemented across our health care system? Um, yeah, I, I guess it's important, again, from an Atlanta perspective, that we continue to to, to collaborate. I, I use the term net gains a lot uh, in my conversations with those three colleagues, that if we can work together uh, in order to expedite any type of process that, that we're trying to help our healthcare system. So, again, um, we are, again, as you know, provincials are, are, are tasked with the responsibility of delivering health care. So we do um, work on our own provincial mandates um, individually but i think it's meetings like this i think we've we've all understood the importance of collaboration uh, we, we do have a lot of commonality in, in, our, in our problems but we do have specific um issues and, and solutions that may be tailor-made to certain parts of the of the country thank you very much i believe we'll be moving to zoom at the moment Thank you very much. If you're a journalist on the Zoom and wish to ask a question, please use the hand raising function. Again, we ask that you limit yourself to one question and one follow up, and please state to whom your question is directed. Si vous êtes journaliste sur le Zoom et vous désirez poser une question, vous utilisez l'option de lever la main. Encore une fois, merci de vous limiter à une question et un suivi, et d'indiquer à qui vous posez uh, votre question. Merci. First question, notre première question est d'Hélène Bouzetti, des Coop de l'Information. Hélène, vous la parole? Yes, hi. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, my question is probably for Minister McLean, but also if someone from Alberta and or Ontario can answer, that'd be great. I just wanted to know um, where the provinces stand in terms of dental care. Ottawa is moving ahead with its program, and province, most provinces have already some sort of coverage. So I wanted to know... Um, is there any disagreement on this? And also, I wanted to to ask the same question about about pharmacare. Um, Ottawa is planning to table a bill before Christmas. What do provinces think about that? I remember in the last meeting in December 2019 in Toronto, most provinces said that we didn't need pharmacare. Right, you go first. Okay. 
Hi, thank you for the question. And uh, I'm very proud of the fact that Alberta has some of the most comprehensive uh, care for low income individuals on dental plans. And so uh, we are in discussion with our federal counterparts and uh, they're very good discussions. Uh, obviously, we don't want to lose what we have and we want to enhance it. So we have some very good discussions ongoing and uh, look forward to sharing more as we have the availability to do so. Thank you. Um, yeah, in, in terms of PEI's perspective on, on dental care and pharma care, again, as a small jurisdiction, um, sometimes one size does not fit all. Uh, we recognize that. I think our federal partners will recognize that too as well. So we need to be cognizant of that as we have these discussions. Again, uh, we too are very proud of our current dental pro program that we have in Prince Edward Island. And again, uh, we'll have continue to have those discussions on pharma care and, and what kind of impacts positive and negative it may have on our current system that we have in Prince Edward Island. But I guess as a follow up, I guess my question was uh, specifically on pharmacare. What's the overall feeling by provinces or sentiment? I remember that back then provinces said, hey, we already have a problem financing the services that already exist. Uh, we should finance those services before adding more. So is that still the sentiment or are you OK with Ottawa going ahead with that? Uh, with respect to pharmacare, I think it's important to recognize that the provinces all have pharmacare programs uh, uh, across the country, about $13 billion worth. And so we've had in it for the last number of years uh, the desire for the federal government to get involved in the national pharmacare program. And it's been, there was a national report that was written by a former Ontario Minister of Health, Eric Hoskins, Dr. Eric Hoskins. And they're proceeding and working on their priority there. We are not aware of the details of that yet. But if you look at pharmacare in Canada, well over 90% of pharmacare uh, supports are provided by the provinces. And so we're an important player in all that. And we're interested in what the federal government is doing. What we really are interested, though, is making sure that Canadians have care. In British Columbia, when we uh, adopted universal access to contraception, for a group of people who tend not to receive deductible-based pharmacare program, namely young women, it has made a very significant impact both in their health and, frankly, in their pocketbook. And the issues of access to prescription drugs are critical in every province. So we're taking action all the time. All of the provinces have taken action, for example, on biosimilars, which is to reduce the cost of prescription drugs in Canada has had a profound and positive impact. It has allowed us to, to, uh, to fund other drugs. So we're very interested in what the federal government is doing and, um, and uh, encouraged that they'd want to play a, a role in this to support Canadians. But our focus is on Canadian patients, on people living with chronic diseases, on people who have rare diseases and are facing sometimes catastrophic cancer consequences in getting access to the drugs they want. Every single provincial jurisdiction has been acting in this area, and the federal government is going to come forward with its legislation, and uh, we're looking forward to seeing uh, what that looks like. Thank you. Merci. Our next question will go to Lindsay Armstrong with the Canadian Press. Please go ahead, Lindsay. Thank you very much. My question is for Minister Dubé. I'm wondering what are the sticking points in the negotiations for Quebec, and what changes do you need to be able to sign on? Well, I, I answered that a, a bit previously. We, uh, when we had the first representation, we were very clear that the, the transfer from federal had to be without conditions. And this is uh, not negotiable for us. We've been very clear that health is a, a matter of uh, provincial jurisdiction, and we stick to that. So I don't have any more comment on that. Thank you. Any follow-up, Lindsay? Hi, yes. Um, a question for Minister McLean. Um, regarding the PharmaCare legislation, what specifically is needed for your province to administer such a program? What needs to be in the legislation for that to work for you on a provincial level? 
Um, thank you for the question. Sorry. Um, again, I, I think we need to, um, as, as Minister Holland explained to us today during meetings, is that there's ongoing conversations in, in Ottawa with regards to what a pharmacare program will look like. Um, again, um, as he navigates a, a minority government and how they work with their partners in order to bring a pharmacare program for consideration. So, you know, our officials continue to, to provide input, and that's what these couple days are for, is in order to provide some direction and, and that. But it is, uh, I don't want to use a wait-and-see approach, but again, we need to see um, how this will work. And again, um, we're very sensitive to our, our smallness and our small jurisdiction in that um, a one-size-fits-all may not be appropriate in, in, in Prince Edward Island, and it may not be appropriate in other jurisdictions as well. Thank you. I see. Unfortunately, this will have to be our last question. Malheureusement, il faut que ça soit notre dernière question. We're going to go to Katie Dangerfield with Global News. Katie, please go ahead. Hello. This question is for uh, Minister Holland. Uh, this week, the UK proposed raising the legal age that people in England can buy cigarettes by one year every year until it is illegal for the whole population. Could this be something Canada would consider implementing? Uh, thank you for the question. We know that tobacco is the number one cause of preventable illness in this country. Uh, in fact, it's the only product, uh, if you take as directed, will kill you. Uh, so, you know, cessation efforts are absolutely critical. And in partnership with provinces and territories, uh, uh, with the not-for-profit sector, with, uh, uh, with uh, pharmacists, doctors, nurses, uh, the efforts on cessation have really been remarkable. We've been able to see Canada to have an extremely low prevalence rate, but it needs to be lower. Uh, so, you know, we're going to continue having conversations about how we do just that. I uh, used to be in uh, Ontario on the, uh, the, the Committee for Action on Tobacco, um, and uh, it, it, this is an issue very close to my heart. Uh, it is absolutely devastating to see so many people die and get sick from something that's so preventable. Uh, so, you know, continue to uh, to have, you know, to denormalize it, to find ways to help people with cessation uh, and look at what's the best way to really get at it uh, and base it on evidence uh, of what will work. So we're looking at what other jurisdictions are doing and, uh, and we'll look at the evidence from that to inform our best decisions. Thank you. Any follow up, Katie? Yeah, so... Just to clarify, do you have any tangible examples of what Canada is doing to crack down on tobacco use with youth? Well, you know, this is uh, multi-jurisdictional. Uh, so, you know, one of the things that uh, is so important with cessation efforts is uh, the relationship that people have with their physician or with their pharmacist and the conversations they have with them about the cessation tools that are available. And we're very fortunate. There is a vast array of cessation tools that are available. Uh, the federal government uh, has taken historic action, has been a leader on, uh, for example, uh, plain packaging, uh, on taking aggressive action on, uh, on, on advertising on uh, helping to communicate uh, the dangers of tobacco and work with the uh, the not-for-profit sector and uh, in, in on issues like industry uh, denormalization so folks can understand some of the tactics and ways that tobacco companies here and elsewhere have tried to get people addicted to their product uh, so you know we we have uh, been seen as a global uh, leader in tobacco uh, I think you have every expectation to make sure to, to know that that will continue uh, and that that effort will be multi-jurisdictional Thank you very much. That concludes our event. Live in my Merci beaucoup. This show has been produced by Depictions Media. Please contact us at depictions.media for more information.